Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I'm super excited. This is actually my first D3 meetup ever. So I'm, yeah, thank you, you guys. It's you guys. Uh, no, I'm excited to be here. Um, I really like that Ian came up with this theme for the first meetup of the year of like learning D3. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Despite this show of hands that most people in the room are already using D3, despite the fact that this is the D3 Bay Area D3 users group and not the Bay Area D3 newbies group or whatever. Um, but still, I'm going to talk about learning D3 and hopefully share um, you know, a couple tidbits that may be uh, of use to people, even if, even if you're already really familiar with the tool. So my focus is going to be kind of what is this D3.js thing all about and how do I get started? And a uh, little teeny bit of background on myself. So my name is Scott. I teach at the uh, University of San Francisco in the design program where I try and uh, get students really jazzed about data visualization and um, generative art type work. So first question, what is D3.js? I'm sure we could ask everybody here and get a really different answer. Um, but the answer is actually quite simple, so I'm just going to put it up on the screen. <laughs> um, you know, I think it kind of speaks for itself, uh, so we can just leave it there. No, I know you guys are really good, you're really smart, so I'm going to give you the minified version. It's a little different. <laughs> uh, but that's basically it. So kind of everything you need to know is in those, uh, that nightmare of curly brackets. What's that? Oh, yeah, I know. that's true. Okay, so one guy noticed that I cut off the bottom. Um, so you're right, this isn't the whole story. This is just the top uh, 2K worth or whatever. Um, no, so that's what D3 looks like. What D3 really is is a JavaScript library, and you can use it just like any other JavaScript library. Uh, just like jQuery, a lot of people sort of start out maybe with jQuery and then get into JavaScript that way. So you would embed um, or reference your JavaScript file at the top of your HTML page. So if all this is gibberish, uh, it's to say this is the path to visualizing data on the web, to loading your data up into a page and expressing it visually somehow. So once you've got uh, your reference to D3 in the page, uh, your beautiful D3 code can go there and it will work perfectly. One of the reasons uh, D3 can be tricky to learn is because learning D3 really involves having a somewhat deep or at least a surface uh, understanding of several different web standard technologies. So this includes HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, SVG, and this thing called the DOM, which involves uh, a sort of the model for how browsers render web pages and think about everything as a box and the tree structure of a page. Um, all of these things are web standards, and this is one of the main reasons I think D3 has taken off, besides the fact that it's a sort of brilliantly structured piece of software, although a little bit hard to learn. Um, but it involves all of these things for um, partly because you probably know some of these things already. If you're getting into D3, you may have some background making web pages, so you know, oh, I've seen HTML, I've seen CSS, or I've done a little JavaScript, or um, a lot of us, uh, well, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but I'm guessing a lot of people in this room before D3 were less familiar with, with the last two of these things. So maybe you knew the DOM because you like troubleshooted web pages and you're like trying to get your CSS to work and you have less hair because of it. Uh, but maybe you hadn't used SVG before because SVG is sort of, um, I would like to see some numbers, but I think because of D3, the SVG image format is like hugely popular now in a way that it, it never was. But what's also great about this is because D3 relies on web standards, learning D3 is really a process of learning the web. So everything that you learn when you're diving into this tool, so this is especially for the people who are sort of coming into this fresh and you haven't played with it at all, everything you learn about D3 is going to be extremely useful in other domains outside of visualization um, and outside of the context even of, of JavaScript. So everything you learn about the DOM, everything you learn about images, everything you learn about events and uh, data processing. All this stuff is really useful in other domains. And this is a deliberate design decision by uh, Mike Vostok and the other contributors to D3. Uh, Mike had worked with uh, 
Jeff Hare, and there's sort of this long lineage of these visualization tools going back to uh, Protovi or Polymaps and then Protoviz and Flare and Prefuse, and you might recognize some of these names. And each of these, each of these tools, except Polymaps, relied on a certain level of, of abstraction, a certain level of buy-in of sort of the proprietary nature of the tool. So if you wanted to do a bar chart in um, whatever that one is just called, Protoviz. If you want to do a bar chart in Protoviz, then you would sort of use its built-in bar chart model, and it would know, oh, a bar chart's made up of bars, and you know maybe you have axes and things like that. D3 abstracts all of that away. So instead, you just focus on the data, and the visual representation is completely up to you. So this is, this is part of why it's harder to learn, because it involves sort of getting a little bit deeper into what you're trying to express visually than some of these other tools. These other tools are maybe easier to learn, but they're much less flexible, because once you, if you try and customize something, uh, you get a little bit locked in, and you end up having to rewrite all the code yourself anyway. So I think this is a really important aspect of D3 in terms of learning is you get kind of all these other side benefits that can help you out with all kinds of other projects, uh, even using other tools. So we want to get data onto a web page. What does data look like on the web? Looks like JavaScript arrays, which look like this. Um, how many of you are brave enough to raise your hand and show me that you haven't seen something like this before? Who's new to this JavaScript arrays? Awesome. Okay. Okay. This is for you, man. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. So in JavaScript, a lot of you recognize this already, but basically you can declare variables. Here we have one called data set. And we're setting it to an array of values, which basically means we have one variable that stores multiple values with the same name. Uh, these little hard brackets on either end and the commas between each value tell it that this is an array. So in essence, any data that you are using on the web is going to fit essentially in the structure. Any data you're using with D3 is going to be in an array. So we get used to looking at lots of values strung together with commas. Now, I want to talk about data joins because the concept of the data join is the fundamental premise, the fundamental core concept behind D3. It's super, super important to understand. The actual syntax for it is very uh, somewhat convoluted and counterintuitive until you get used to it. So I want to step through kind of what a data join is and uh, why it's important. And if you pick up any of sort of the technical lingo, that's great. If you don't, that's fine. We just want to understand the concept here. So here we have this data set array that I already made. I have five values, 5, 10, 20, 15, and 18. Uh, and then this is my first piece of D3 code. So we're going to step through like what goes on here. So first I have this D3, which calls the library. If you're used to using jQuery, you probably use like a dollar sign. That's the same thing. You're just referencing the library. Uh, here we say select SVG. So this is my, you know, this is not a real demo. This is my mock-up of a demo. So we're going to pretend I've already made an SVG image that's this, this dashed rectangle. Right now it's empty. It's just it's plain white right now. So I'm selecting that SVG, and that, that function returns this selection. So great, I found my SVG in the document. I'm ready to do something. So let's say I want to make a circle for each one of these data values. So that would be five circles, right? So I start out by selecting the circles. So now I'm within the SVG. I'm going to select all the circles. How many circles do we have? No circles. No circles. No circles. No circles yet. Hence the big question mark, the ominous blue question mark. This is the most confusing part of D3. You select the things you're about to act on before they even exist. And it's just something you get comfortable with, as I'm sure a lot of you are. Um, so let's select these circles that don't exist yet. Um, and then let's take this really important step of actually binding the data. This is where the magic of the data join happens. 
So we have the selection of the SVG. We have the empty selection of circles, no circles. That's handed off to the data function. And we're giving the data function our data set. So what the data function actually does is a little bit more complex than, than what it looks to do. Essentially, it looks at this data set. It says, oh, you have five values. Great, thanks for that. And it says, how many circles do you have? How many things do you have in your selection? Well, it turns out you have zero things right now. So we're just starting. This is our first time doing this. Um, so five minus zero is five. We have room for five more, five new circles. Little counterintuitive, as you would imagine, but it'll make sense. Then, because we have more data values than elements, we can use this enter method to access that selection of these new elements. So these new elements that now also still do not exist. So we've selected things that don't exist, and we're taking, thing, taking values that do exist and binding them things to things that don't exist. Very confusing. Just put it out of your mind. Listen to me, but put it out of your mind. Just let it flow. Let it flow. Um, so here I'm envisioning these are my, my five new circles that I'm about to create. And the essence of the data join is when we take these values from the data set and you can imagine them flying down and getting stuck onto these circles. So this is the join. We're joining the values to the elements. One value, one element. And finally, we use the append method to actually create the circles within the SVG. So we've taken these empty elements, now we've actually created them, and if you were to look in the, um, you know, in your browser, open your developer tools, whatever, you'd actually see those five circles in there. This is the brilliant part of D3, as convoluted as this process is, is now we have one object in the document object model, sort of one object in memory in the browser that's tied to one uh, value, one datum. So who cares? We've got some blue circles. We have some numbers on them. Now we can set their attributes. We probably don't want all the circles to look the same or be in the same position or whatever. We want to actually encode that data. So here I'm going to say, let's change their radius to be set to the value of the associated data value. So my number, my five circle gets smaller, my 10 circle stays the same, my 20 circle gets a radius of 20, and 15 and 18. So what's really cool about this is you'll notice up in my code, I say D3, select all circle. Now I'm selecting all the circles again. This time they exist, so that's exciting. Um, and then I set the attribute of R, so the attribute of radius, and I'm going to set this to D. D represents the data value that's already tied to that one object. This might not seem super powerful, but if you've ever done any other sort of graphics programming, you might be used to having to constantly reference your arrays of values, having to constantly re-pull from your data set. But basically what D3 is doing is it's leveraging this built-in functionality that you get from the browser. So we're saying, okay, the browser keeps track of objects. The browser keeps track of all these things. Then they just sit there until we tell them to change. So right now it's going to have these five circles and they're going to sit there. And it's going to have these five values in memory and we can reference those anytime. So I can say, well, right now I want my circles to uh, change size. I want to encode my values in the size of the circle. But maybe later I want to encode it as color or I want to encode it as um, X, Y coordinates. I want to encode those values in space. And all it takes is just this simple attribute statement. Yeah, question. Question? Yeah. yeah. Blue and positions are default values before you start using no. attributes? Or yeah, this so is also part of the app? So the question is, does D3 make everything blue and evenly spaced out like I just did before you specify? No. Yeah. So this is, this is not a live demo. This is just uh, me illustrating kind of in a cartoon fashion what it would look like. So yeah, no, blue is not the default. You can, you can set it to whatever you want. So do you have it assigned a color? Right. Ah, there are other if you haven't assigned a color, yeah, it would actually be black. 
because I think that's SVG's so default. Are all the same for the position would be like zero, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I apologize, this is a little confusing illustration because all I'm doing is trying to illustrate how to change the size of the circles, not the position. But hopefully you get the idea. Um, so what's useful about this binding of data to elements? Well, it lets you reference the values later, like I was saying, without having to constantly go back to the original data set. And uh, it prevents this need to redraw elements. So I've also done a lot of work with processing. If you've ever used processing or like a similar, uh, similar language, you know that basically you have this canvas um, and you have to, every frame, basically recalculate all of your objects and redraw them in new positions, new sizes, new colors, whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, but because we're taking advantage of the browser here, you know, when you make a normal web page and you have a paragraph of text, it just sits there. It stays as a paragraph of text until you tell it to do something else with JavaScript. So we have this sort of persistency of objects uh, that you don't get in a lot of other contexts, which is really nice. So that's kind of the, the data join. That's sort of the, the biggie. D3 can do a lot else for you. Uh, I'm just going to walk through a couple of things really quick right now. Um, first, it has built-in functions to help you scale values. This is super nice um, because you can you know, do the math yourself. But it's really helpful to have these built-in scales. Um, best example I know of is usually Unless you're super, super, super lucky, your data values are not going to correspond to pixel values for the screen. So if you have a value of 100 in your data set, you might want that bar or that circle or that you know, color, whatever. You might want to encode it as something that doesn't actually need the value 100. It might need it in a different scale. So if you can think about this, you have an input domain. Uh, in this case, in my example, it's goes from 200 to 1,000. So that's like the range of my, my data. And you have an output range of 0 to 500. So in this case, what this means is, let's say I have an SVG image that's 500 pixels wide. And I want to take a value that is, say, in the middle of my data set. Say it's at 600. And I want it to show up in the middle of my SVG, which is 500 across. So basically, by scaling that, my new value, my pixel value, becomes 250. Um, if you're familiar with the process of normalization, that's all that this is doing in this case. It's saying, OK, we're taking things from one scale, changing it to a scale of 0 to 1, and then pushing it back out to another scale. So the math in this case for a linear scale is not too complicated, but um, I just show this example because D3 has a ton of built-in scales that saves you from a lot more complex math. It's really nice. Axes. Once you've got your scale, oftentimes you'll want to label it with an axis. SVG has built in axis generators. It's really smart about choosing how to put these little tick marks in and where to position the labels. So that's stuff that, for example, ProtoViz was also really good at. Um, but it's really nice here. So you can see here, you don't have to understand all this code, but you can see um, right here I'm referencing the scale I created before. Um, so this axis generator knows it's looking back and it's saying, oh, that's right, Scott made this scale that's going from 200 to 1,000, whatever, whatever. I'm going to reference that and I'm going to make the corresponding axis that goes from 200 to 1,000 because those are my, the range of my data values. Transitions and motion, D3 is super, super awesome at. It's kind of insane. If you've done any web development stuff, it's really nice because you can say, oh, like this bar is this kind of weird green, and maybe you specify it as a hex color, and then you say, oh, but I want it to turn pink, which you specify as P-I-N-K, and it's like smart enough to automatically determine those types and then like do these transitions for you and different kinds of easing functions and stuff. So all these transitions, color changes, height, width, size, like any attribute that you can set. Like I was setting the size of the circles before, you can transition. And it's, it's handled in a really smart way. Interactivity, of course. Everybody loves awesome tool tips. Um, I prefer yellow ones. Please don't make them in any other color. <laughs> um, 
D3 is really helpful with this too. Uh, sort of like jQuery, if you've used that, it lets you very easily bind, uh, bind functions to events so that um, you can have things respond to user interaction, which is really nice. Getting into the more complicated stuff, D3 has a built in, uh, several built in layouts. I find this name a little confusing because it doesn't actually lay anything out for you. Uh, the layouts just provide handy ways for you to convert your data into the format that you need for each of these other types of presentations. Um, so if you're trying to do a stream graph like we see up here, um, it's really challenging to go just from a raw data set directly to that. Usually you need to sort of calculate a bunch of other numbers in order to set the height and thicknesses of those bars. So it's really helpful with all those sort of uh, data uh, processing kinds of things. And geomapping and projections. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the, the gallery of D3 projections right now, but um, I think it supports more than 60 projections currently. And I don't know about you, I don't have any kind of history in mapping projections, but I'm starting to really geek out on it and it's pretty awesome. Because uh, there's all sorts of like interesting politics involved. Uh, I've done some geomapping projects and this comes up a lot. Like, well, everybody uses the Mercator because it's sort of the easiest, but obviously there's this huge North America, or Northern Hemisphere bias. And like there are all sorts of political <coughs> distor distortions where some countries look bigger than others. And, um, you know, who's your audience? Is somebody going to be offended? Uh, you know, what if Canada decides to come down and take over? Like that sort of thing. So you want to be nice to everybody. That's uh, the fundamental rule of D3, not data joins. Just be nice to everybody. And uh, keep an eye on the projections page because it's really wild. Um, Jason Davies and I think um, some other people who are in this room have been doing some really insane work in this front. So tons of mapping options with D3. I think more than you'd find in pretty much any other tool. So this is where we take a deep breath because I understand this could be super, super overwhelming. I know I definitely find it overwhelming at times. There's so much to learn, so many different things, um, so many skills, so many questions on the D3 group, if you're on the group, so many questions on Stack Overflow. You know, people are like freaking out trying to understand this tool. And I think it's important to step back and just remember, just focus on what you're trying to do. Don't try and, you know, out-compete Jason Davies with his map projections or whatever. He has a whole background in mathematics, so like probably you don't. I definitely don't. Um, don't stress out about that. Just do like one thing at a time. Focus on like what you need for your project, and eventually you'll sort of build up this, uh, this familiarity and get, get comfortable, and then you can help other people do the same thing. So it's really nice. One thing that's really nice about learning-wise is obviously we have this fantastic community, especially here in the Bay Area, we have so many people here. It's kind of, it's uh, really kind of amazing. Which brings me to what I think is your most important step in <laughs> learning D3 is uh, this new book, which I'm super excited about. I am so close to doing the final, final edits, and I know a bunch of you have like looked at the book, posted comments online, uh, purchased the book even, which is awesome. I've uh, been going through tons of good feedback from people, so I really appreciate that. We've caught a lot of typos, a lot of weird errors and stuff. Um, I think this is a really nice resource. Obviously, I'm biased, but this is going to be out uh, final, final edition um, sometime in March, so sometime very soon. And uh, I hope you'll check it out because it has cute little birds on the cover, and I don't know if you noticed, but they're interactive. They're sort of like pecking at the title. So <laughs> I think it's pretty appropriate. I'm really psyched about it. And uh, yeah, you can find me at a line left. I think we have a few minutes for questions. So thanks for listening. <laughs>